<laughs> I'm so excited to hear you play VWV814 in D minor, French Suite written in 1722. Yes. And um, by the way, when did you start practicing this masterpiece? In December. I had, uh, in... I had just finished a recital that I did in November with, you know, I was playing the Liszt B minor suite sonata. And so I thought I would stick with the B minor theme. I see. It's a very interesting thing because um, the um, expression of your minuet in the recording that you sent me earlier was very much um, romantic era music. When you... Um, <laughs> where you combine the intervals into chords. <laughs> and so the music, which is originally two voice style um, genre invention, in Bach, with a little bit of overlapping fingers and pedal, became a harmonization. wondering if this kind of choice was made because the acoustics in the room where you record are very dry? Yes, um, that is part of it. But also, it's, that's just how it comes from me. It's, it, lately, that's just how I play it. So it's your musical intuition? I think so. Good. It just happens. I don't good, know if it's good. right or not. But Well, I don't think that I am in the um, capacity to determine the right and the wrong especially for music that nobody heard anybody play then. <laughs> but I can say that uh, it seems to me like you are doing certain things to compensate for certain things. That's what I thought about the acoustics. Another thing which I found very interesting in the video you sent me to prepare the lesson is that the piano on which you play had some kind of a small stick open uh, top on top of which you had a little kind of coat yeah a little blanket a blanket yeah and i was wondering if you put it because you thought the piano was too aggressively loud and you needed to muffle it no i mean i i i didn't even realize it was there i i noticed it afterwards in the recording i thought it, i thought it was perhaps again uh, the the desire to compensate or to accentuate effects you know no i keep i keep the blanket on here all the time, the lid is closed now. Um, is it because of neighbors? Because of dust. Aha! A lot of dust. It keeps the dust out. You know, we're, yeah. What do we Years say about ago, dust? when I was young, mm -hmm. I gave a master class in um, um, Egypt. <laughs> and um, in, the must, in the conservatory of Cairo, they had a Bösendorfer imperial size model piano. Except when I played it, it sounded like a saloon piano from the Westerns, you know? <laughs> and I look at it inside and it looks all entirely dusty. Like you don't see any metallic aspect. It's all like dust. And I ask the people there, why is it so dusty? And they say, it's not dust, it's sand. Wow. <laughs> because they get sandstorms and it goes through the buildings, supposedly through the skin. <laughs> Amazing. So I remember playing that uh, sanded person doctor, <laughs> which was naturally muted. And actually a more interesting relevant story of that master class that remains with me forever is that I asked one of the students, the translator, asking, why did you choose this tempo in this Rachmaninoff piece? And the translator told me, I cannot ask this question. And I said, why can't you? I ask you to ask it, because I don't speak Arabic. And the translator says, here we don't ask them how they think, we just tell them how to think, <laughs> literally. And I was like, oh my God, where did I land? <laughs> and I say, what do you mean? And she says, all our teachers are Russian. Uh, they came already in the 50s when Nasser was president and he was 
pro-Soviet Union. So they send in a lot and supposedly many remain in Egypt teaching the ne next generations. And they say that the Russian teaching, according to them, is the teacher uh, rules and you obey. So the fact that I ask, how did you choose and what is your, how do you, how do you feel about this tempo is, was already a faux pas. So now that we're going to work today with you on your beautiful French music of Bach, I would like to know if you are aware that in the tradition, the Anglaise is played before the minuet. Or you had not known about that? Um, I, I guess I, I played it that way because that's how my score has it in the order. Yeah, but normally the minuet comes after the sarabande. Uh, yes. When in the specific French clavicinist order. And the major reason for which that happens is that unlike Bach who determines in each of his partitas and suites, each movement as you know for each mm -hmm. piece, the French clavecinist who started the idea of the dance suites on the, on the harpsichord about a century before Bach almost, they never wrote the exact pieces. They wrote 12 or 20 uh, of each dance in each key. And so the performer picked and chosen made his own sandwich. So it was not uh, the suite of the composer, it was the suite chosen of pieces of the composer. Yeah. And Bach, who was much more of a pedagogue, thought that that was too much freedom for, for the students to give bad taste. Perhaps he should have taught in Cairo. Because he decided to be very um, directive. But then he wanted to write French style. Unfortunately, he never knew what French style was because <laughs> very few people at the time of before Bach or Bach's time traveled so much. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Roberger? Yeah, I, I have. Uh, I have a play. I have a piece of his on my computer. I've been meaning to print it out and start learning it, but I haven't touched a harpsichord in months. Because Froberger studied originally with Frescobaldi in Rome. Yeah. And then in Versailles. And then returned to Germany. So he literally cross pollinated Europe. <laughs> and so when Bach heard of French style, it was a very remote idea. It's like, let me write a Martian suite. I think on Mars, the glow is dark. So I'm going to write a glow dark piece, you know? Yeah. But unlike Froberger, Bach never went to France. Yes. Never met really French composers. The saying goes that there was a duel that was considered not a competition yet, but a prince in Germany between Bach and a French harpsichordist called, um, what is his name? Uh, Marchand, Louis Marchand. Mm -hmm. And so they were supposed to outplay each other like a battle today in rap. Okay. And supposedly during the warm up session, which I wonder why Bach had to need a warm up session, that's probably the embellishment of the story. That is probably more invented than true, but it's attempting that Marchand saw Bach play the chromatic fantasy with thumbs. My God, using thumbs on the keyboard, the audacity escapes me. Yes. And that he left the court before the competition of the duel started by defaulting because he couldn't play against somebody who plays with the thumbs. <laughs> Unfair advantage, you know. <laughs> He's got the nukes. I'm not going to put my, you know, soldiers on horse to fight the nukes. So I think for the time, Bach must have been considered not exactly the most appropriate stylistic performer. No. But he certainly tried to write a lot of things. And I think that writing in Anglaise in a French suite is like really a faux pas. Because there is no more hereditarian um, uh, um, 
how do you call that, um, enemy to France than England. Yeah, exactly. So if you write a French suite and one of your movements is Anglais, like, give me a break. So <laughs> I always know that the jig comes from Ireland, traditionally, the jig. So I thought, why didn't he call it Irlandaise? <laughs> After he wrote Anglaise. And the first is Allemande, which anyway means German in French, which he didn't speak. Yeah. <laughs> and the French clavecinist called Allemande the first pieces only to make fun of the Germans because they were heavy. <laughs> and then the Italianate courant is the running dance. Courir is to, to run. Yeah. So, and the Sarabande was South American dance that the conquistadors brought some of the savages with them, presented them to the court, and they started dancing very um, erratically, that dance, the Zarabanda, and they decided at the court that this is going to give too much mayhem to their people. Let's cool it down to a stately dance. <laughs> Slow. Yeah, very slow. Like take a heavy metal song and make it to a lullaby. And so all of a sudden the Saravans today are like, what is Haydn's sonata, sonata form in the early Viennese school, the Andantes. Mm -hmm. And the Allemande with two themes of development recapped was the first movement. Mm -hmm. The Menuet became the scherzo. And the jig was the rondo with A, B, A, C, A, D, A. Exactly. I think it's always about stylization. Because most people don't realize how less than often the harpsichord is played alone mm -hmm. in the Baroque times. The harpsichord was the portable keyboard to accompany practice, rehearse, singing, or other instruments. Basically a rehearsal instrument because the church organ was in the church, obviously couldn't move it out. And so the repertoire solo was really the imitation of the two things music was used for, to dance and to sing. Mm -hmm. And it's only the sonata form and the fugue with Bach that are the two forms that are supposedly dedicated to the instrument as a concept of pure music, mm -hmm. not an imitation of dancing and singing. Do you feel that a lot in this piece, the dancing and the singing? I, I try to, I try to, but then I, you know, when I play it, I look around and there's nobody there. And so usually I, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I, 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 well, I stop hearing it. That my way. friends rarely, my friends rarely dance the Allemande with me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's hard to find true Baroque the whole, dancers. The, the whole idea of the dance um, the way the Baroque musicians stylized it on the keyboard was nothing but because of the social encounters. So if you wanted to be accepted in the society of the given prince king, play them on the piano was almost like an imitation. I mean, of course, they didn't have a piano, but you know, the forte piano, harpsichord. You know, when you don't move, I don't know if you froze yeah. or you so, are still on. <laughs> you, whatever you just said, I, I don't know if it got picked up on the recording or not. Could you just say it again? Alors, je suis très content de t'entendre jouer le piano. I always think for that, when they say that we are all tapped on our phone calls, and I always say, who are people so bored to listen to my conversation? <laughs> Let me speak in another language for the fun of it. Yeah. yeah. No, what I'm trying to say is that the stylized dances, of course, today they don't have the same meaning because nobody dances them choreographically for social reasons. And so the whole idea of um, the choreography was more important than the performance. And therefore, um, the echo of the dance stylized on the piano or today or harpsichord then, um, doesn't appear to us as a translation. It seems to us like the piece is a piece. <laughs> Uh, 
decorations, the ornamentations, the decorations, the appoggiaturas, the effects, the upbeats, the downbeats, the phrasing, the direction, the bowing, the breathing, stop me. <laughs> because I could continue. Yes. Adding a little too many factors into it. So tell me when you play the Allemande, what is the first thing that you want to, so to say, control? Is it the ornaments? To control? Yeah, in your touch. Because some of the ornaments you play from the upper note, and sometimes you come from the upper note, and you still replay from the upper note. Mm -hmm. well, well, I mean, as far as the ornamentation goes, I... Um... I can I so I conform to the traditional harpsichord ornaments, which are trills from above, unless notated. You otherwise. come unless you come from above. That's what I meant. Because the upper mm. note is only because the baroque uh, ornamentation was in fact an enhanced appoggiatura. Appoggiare in Italian means to lean. Therefore, you lean on the real note from the above note. repeat that redundancy you become a trill yeah so that's yeah. why we like to think that they were played on the beat and on the dissonance from the upper note the dissonant yeah. note yeah but if you come from a passing tone that is the passing tone the upper note of that real note then we would play the real note if you if if the if the if the melodic line originates from the upper note of the trio of the mordant, mm -hmm. and I notice that sometimes you you replay the note, it becomes a repeated note, ta -ta -ta -da, and it sounds very much like chopped. Hmm. I'll have to listen. I'll have to listen to that. You know, I've been playing them the same way for so long now that I probably. It's, well, I mean, so long is only a few months. Exactly. Yeah, and so I'm, I'll but, try and... But, and so what I'm trying again. to say is that you observe also in the notation that ornaments are randomly placed, the, the decorative ornaments, and very more often in the right hand than in the left. Yes. And you wonder, didn't they know how to ornament with the left hand? <laughs> or was it meant that this, it's suggested that if you hear it in the right hand, <laughs> You, you will do it by the imitation. You'll imitate also the ornament without to be told. Yeah. My problem is that I have such issues ornamenting with my left hand. I just never do it by habit. So, in fact, it's you. It's, well, <laughs> there's very few in the score, and let's just say I'm happy for, about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm like sorry to him. Open Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> If you had to play it in total unison, <laughs> like the Frank Sonata, and not in imitation. Here you're really in imitation. I think that you should play the ornaments in both hands, but that's first one. Secondly, I think your Allemande was played at least in the recording that you sent me before the lesson to prepare for the lesson. I don't know how much that tempo was um, deeply um, passed under scrutiny, or was it just impulsive? I think it was way too fast. Really? I know, I, I felt like you were going for the face, of the, sorry, for the direction of the line. <laughs> You are like going somewhere, and because of that, you needed to have the drive to go there. And you started an upbeat anyway. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. It's like I, you're a man with a purpose. And so the music is very purposeful. And it feels like you enter in something of an almost dispute between two people who don't agree. The two voices, I mean. I, I'm just in shock because I remember it playing it pretty slowly. I thought it was fast for me, but you see, a consonance to the one is a dissonance to the others. You know? Well, I mean, so, 
I mean, because I, I felt play for me the opening of the tempo the way you think it should be without me having said what I just did. Well, I'll just try and play it like I played it yesterday or two days. That's ago. what I mean. Play it like before I mentioned what I said. I still think that you played it not so slow the other day. It wasn't that slow. I'll have to go back and listen to it. Strange. I remember playing it about that fast. Or is it that the speed of, the, of your mordents, Matthew, was too tight? <laughs> was very tight. I don't know if it was the tempo or the ornaments. <laughs> but in any case, um, if you take out the pat patterns of the decoration and you, and you loosen the speed of the mordants, of the ornaments, then you have the naked blue notes. So of course then it's just a skeleton of relatively step motion motions anyway he didn't have much more than three or four octaves so it's not like he could have done <laughs> <laughs> so inevitably <coughs> the sense of uh, pace comes from the flow and what would be if you play the um Le Monde first half without any ornament just the decorations is written do you know what I mean by decorations? Yeah, so like this. Uh, yeah, that's a decoration. The, the which you added or which is in the score? It's in the score, but it's, it's well known. It's not in the original. Yeah, that is then a dec an improvised decoration. A decoration, exactly. What I meant by decoration is the written ones. <laughs> In other words, another pattern, but he determines them because he's obliging the people to play what he wrote. That's his pedagogical way. Uh -huh. But of course, the, I speak about the play without the written um, uh, codified ornaments so. and just play. Okay. Can you do that, please? Yes. Thank you. I like very much that approach for the tempo <laughs> because now it's simpler it's less notes so it can flow mm -hmm. but when it's going to be so filled with ornaments i think it will be a little slower but anyway now something very important which i noticed in our recording and i when you played i reminded me up to the opening few bars you have a left hand series of so-called moving bass basso continuo only eighth notes in the, all of a sudden, it's all about the right hand. You know what I mean? So I'm not paying enough attention to the left hand in my performance? Not enough at all. Okay, so there are no, paying no attention. Because in the yeah. beginning, it was an equal partner. Oh, really? <laughs> I had a dialogue and then all of a sudden, <coughs> When you have this long monologue of the right hand, I want the sub-phrasing of your left hand equal eighth notes to be nor legato, nor detached, but groupments of uneven numbers. You don't want to do two and two and two, or three and three and, I mean, in four, four, it would be normally four and two, two, or it could be, I would like you to do something chemiolic, like three and threes, something that, um, changes bow in the middle of uh, the right hand 
Because right now what happens is that all of a sudden the left hand becomes erased from the dialogue in the, uh, in, in, the, in, the in the section. Yeah, I, I, I realized those things too after I listened to them when I was done. It was like, uh, I stopped listening to the left hand there. But when we hear good play, it's all detached. Yeah. And when we hear others play, it's like Richter, it's all legato. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the whole point of these sections, which are, yes, arias with continuo, is that the continuo has to change bows by groupments of bars, notes. And not be just... Because then at, at some point, the fact that he's unrhythmed gives us the impression that he's just neutral and all of a sudden disappears. And that on the harpsichord is different because you subphrase everything by essence. And, and fingerings, mm -hmm. and the whole aspect of the instrument. On the piano is an instrument which is built to be played equalized. Mm -hmm. So we do tend to play everything even. And unfortunately that doesn't function for Bach on the piano. Mm -hmm. But I still think that um, when you will add the ornaments, I would like you to play it under that tempo so that you don't have to squeeze the ornaments so fast. Mm -hmm. So, like this. So, you are, you are, um, if you do that, you have a statement that says, I ignore everything. I just play my way. And I think that if the ornaments are that loose, mm -hmm. they become quasi 16th notes. Yeah, exactly. So then it defeats the purpose of the 16th notes that exist. And I think you should find some kind of a pace of the grace notes of these unwritten, rhythmically speaking, notated, um, um, uh, codified signs mm -hmm. that they are faster than a 16th, but they're not a 32nd, mm -hmm. perhaps a triplet. Okay, okay. Something loosely not fitting. Yes. Yeah. Because if it's so stretched, it becomes flat. Mm -hmm. And if it's too tight, it becomes nervous angry or jittery yeah or just too loud i'm not sure because the original idea that bach knew about french style was the uneven jeu inégal mm -hmm. the and so here he didn't do have been imitating the so-called French overtures, I'm sure you know about, of mm -hmm. course. And so, I'm not convinced that they played evenly every note. Perhaps they played. Mm -hmm. The jeu inégal on the harpsichord is the principle, the basic nucleus principle of their expression. Yeah. Whenever on the piano is exactly the opposite. We play even. What happened? Well, I, I would love to be able to play this piece with an egal, but I was never able to really figure it out when I was studying the harp. Because if you play very inegal on the piano, you're going to sound like you're drunk. Oh, even on the harpsichord, I can never figure it out. Because oh, it... yeah, because <laughs> it's more subtle than just said. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I understand I, that you're very subtle, I know you, so I'm not saying that it's simple like this, but I'm saying that if we play it on the piano and the piano is made with a longer resonance of each sound, we have a sense of connection, call it legato, call it air legato, call it singing legato, parlando, at, at whichever way there is some kind of um, narrative quality on the piano. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it, it's more it's singing more than it's dancing 
-hmm. by essence. And of course, if you play it, then you appear to imitate the harpsichord at a very superficial level, which is just the shortness of tones. But they do have resonances that overlap. Yeah, they sure do. The so-called uh, bleeding when they play. Uh, it's in fact more imitative of the dance and of the bowing than of the harpsichord as an instrument. Mm -hmm. Because all these uh, patterns in the voices that he writes are very much melodically phrased. Mm -hmm. Could be an aria. My God, my shoe, well, anyway, thank God I don't sing. I noticed that you play deliciously legato your triton. It's like, okay. ladies and gentlemen, it's a pickle, but I will sweeten it. <laughs> I personally am convinced that when Bach wrote an augmented second, not often, or a more often augmented fourth, these dissonant uh, in intervals, it was to create an effect of expression that is to do with pain and, rupt and something that's disrupting. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's in unthinkable to connect legato a uh, triton. I would do. I because I what you do. That. What you do between G and A sharp is an augmented second, what we call the harmonic minor. And the problem is that we call it harmonic, which for a scale is like an ostrich. It's a bird that doesn't fly. So to call it a scale harmonic, it's the contrary of what a scale is. A scale is melodic by essence. If not, you wouldn't sing it. That's why it's mode. And so the idea to have a separation bigger than a step, the step and a half, Bach does very rarely. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for a, like in the second partita, he uses it, um, I forgot where is it now. But no, generally, I think it's considered as a sixth degree being minor going to the dominant. Mm -hmm. In this case, um, and the leading tone. But when you go and you use that stretching of the intervals, I would do a, a re articulation if not a, if you don't want to do a gap or a break, but a re articulation. I wouldn't do. to justify it to a young man like you who is so musical because um, in fact I feel like I took off one of the pleasures of your performing the piece. <laughs> well, like, might... What is this old dude I... making me not play the only thing that makes me so loving it? Well luckily for you I might not listen but I'll, uh, I'll write it in anyways. With those headphones, I have the impression that you're an airplane pilot. Airplane pilot. <laughs> but I can say that um, Bach uses very purposefully these dissonant intervals melodically, regardless if they're bowed in the same bow or change of bow, if you breathe between, if you have a, uh, in singing perhaps a different syllable, regardless. But I still think that you are, yeah, that's my opinion about the dissonant intervals melodically they got. So, what do you think about the meter of your courant? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You want to ask uh, me something? So you think that, I mean, if I, if I understood you right, you enjoy the s space in between the dissonant intervals more than the connection. I rather enjoy the rearticulation, like you put the 
you put a restatement. It doesn't have to be an interruption, but it's not. Listen, why? Um, well, it is exactly why I told you is because he doesn't write melodically in minor mode, uh, other than usually in the uh, minor ascending and descending. We call natural minor on the way down and major on the top part of the minor bottom for the ascending minor. That takes care of the problem. So you don't do melodically, you do? Oh, okay, so it's okay, okay. Which is why they call it harmonic. But because I, it's the harmonization that justifies that harmonic mode. But the mode by essence is not harmonic, it's melodic. And so by essence, what they use in the singing is step motion and they don't use melodically a, a tense interval like or this reminds me of the theory classes from uh, Ema last summer, mm -hmm. a little bit. You know, um, I'm thinking about, well, because there's a contrapuntal motive in this piece, right? And it's in the left hand of the right hand. But then here, when he uses the tritone, can you see? That's yes, I, I see. Um, yeah. That's when he begins writing with the figure bass or the, the yes but the right hand does are always ascending perfect force and only once augmented fourth which is what uh, berg does in the sonata but mm -hmm. generally speaking all his ascending force are perfect except this one well and then there's a diminished fifth in the next iteration C yes, G. yes, that's so what I would do. I would think more of um, Matthew, more of a change of bow than an interruption, a re articulation, a new element of two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Well, and not only that, but a change in the rhythmic feel, whereas before it was ba bump, bump, bump. Bum, bum, bum. Quarter notes, mm -hmm. here it kind of becomes da dun 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 eighth notes. That's what we call a rhythmic accelerando because it goes by eighth notes, whether it goes by quarter notes. Yeah. So it gives a sense of uh, precipitation towards the cadential point of the punctuation, right? And I have never heard of that before, rhythmic accelerando. But it is, because the harmonic progression moves twice faster by eighth notes. When you're beginning, it was by quarter notes. And then, but of course, when you perform it and you want to be strict in tempo, you still have that effect with that, because it's embedded in the texture. But because we have been since then hearing music like Scriabin, Ligeti, and who knows else, it's so difficult for us to appreciate the audacity of this. Yes. In fact, the advantage of the people who studied with Bach is that they never knew the music after them. <laughs> and the people who studied Beethoven knew very little of the music of the past, and of course, none of the future. Today, we are submerged, submerged, sorry, by the knowledge of the different styles. And because somehow, it's so beautiful in the sense of a romantic era beauty, which is what Chopin brings us so much that, and Chopin is very classical, but very romantic too in the expression, classical in this harmonic progressions rather. Well, because we always hear about rhythmic uh, retardando, like the classic example is the Brahms thing, you know, where he, he makes everything longer, but we never hear about Especially with it. Rondo. <laughs> Me, ho, las. Yes, exactly. And triplets. But that, and... Yeah, but uh, what I wanted to say is that um, the final chorus of St. Matthew <laughs>
is an augmented uh, second, a, deco a decoder of the first statement of the final chorus of St. Matthew. And every time I hear that, it gives me jitters. Mm -hmm. It's like an electro electroshock. Whenever when uh, Bernstein wrote um, um, West Side Story, it's all about it. <laughs> about that note that is almost the fifth but just under mm -hmm. it's more about tension it's more about the jazzy under note notes when in Bach is more stately but you see it's all about context and how difficult for us to um, separate the different expressions of music that brings us to 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 so many styles and to to keep separating and somehow defining compartmental ways of different compartments of expression levels i think it's probably the hardest thing is to to try to hear it for how people perceived the audacity of this then for what it was like a rhythmic actually around oh my god and you play the Berg Sonata or Scriabin Sonata, mm -hmm. the whole thing is high seas with waves everywhere, and you're just floating and not knowing where you're gonna land on which beach. And so when you hear something so organized, mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to ask you what you think about the Courant's meter. Yeah, the 6-4. Because his meter for the jig is 3-8. Yeah. And he has written Courant's also in 3-8. Yeah. Usually, I think that the 6-4 Courant is actually pretty unusual for him. Um, but th th there's so, a few. Yeah. And so the question is, what does it mean to us in terms of what we do in the interpretation. Do we think because of the longer bars that therefore it's a faster tempo in order to catch to the next downbeat? <laughs> because you see further yeah. by the fact that you don't have a bar line in between every several. Whenever when you play, you see it's chopped. Yeah. So I wonder if because it's 6-4 and therefore you have less bar lines, you find it more freeing to flow the phrasing forward. Well, the classic, you know, courant shift is the change from three feeling in three to feeling in two or vice versa. And in this piece, you know, it's almost always in two. And I noticed that you brought you brought that very clearly. The 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 oh, pillars of the beat. Well, it's taken me months just to finally get that. So because I'm glad I'm at least there. And so the problem is that the right hand plays on the piano very expressively the long values, as well as the long short values. And you don't want to, by being so genuine in your musicianship, to bring a combination of the two. Oh, okay. So and for that, yeah. you have to be more disciplined and choose which one will be playing louder than the other. And if it was... Or it could be the opposite. Now you could also do the touch difference, like air legato with legato. It's more on the table uh, interesting to say so, but in reality it sounds pedantic. Uh, it sounds like I'm a teacher and I'm playing the piano to teach you. It's like, oh, I don't want that. Well, what you want is for me to distinguish the two different voices. Well, to do that, you have to play shadows and light. So they have three choices. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I just, it's just really hard. <laughs> Unless you whistle one. <laughs> so obviously the problem with that is that for 30 more years I was teaching desperately the layering voiced um, 
polyphony in the same hand in Bach's music for pianists. And then in the latest years, I, was, I got tired to swim against the tide. And I decided to say, you know what, if after all, the composer himself was ambiguous about it. <laughs> if Bach really wanted to hear two voices, them away, he bunches them, and the length of sound anywhere on the harpsichord was gone. So you had a new phrase. And then yes. you, have to, you have to keep it in mind. So you could do different in egal in order to differentiate the two voices by doing two different types, types of in egal. like two drums walking in the street, trying to walk straight. <laughs> but I still think that therefore, perhaps ultimately, if he places two independent voices in the same hand, therefore in the same octave uh, stretch space, that perhaps he really wanted somebody to be able to hear a combination rather than a, a layering. Which makes sense with the flow of the of the courant as a running. Usually, if you run, it's hard to be polyphonic at the same time. If I was writing a courant, I'll go. That's it. I'm flowing there. But when you start doing these up and down stems, and the right hand is not all; it's the left hand that's a problem also, because you have to fit it. When you study it, do you practice it always with the right hand? Or do you also play sometimes the left hand alone to just uh, get aware of what is by its own? Of course. And sometimes I practice the right hand by its own too. And sometimes, you know, I'll split the bars in half and do the right hand. And when it goes on in the left hand, I'll play that alone. And I try to do as many different combinations as I can. But when you play the two, you still follow the top. Well... That's the... It's a question. It's not an affirmation. Yeah. I oh, ask, it's... do you? Yeah. Well, you, you asked me another question just now. What happens when I actually play it? When I yeah, because it? if the left hand, if the right hand played the left hand, and you had invertible contrapoint, then the left hand melodic line becomes, big, being above, becomes the leader. And this, whatever yeah. the notes. Yeah. And it seems to me like it's all inter, in, uh, in, uh, in, invertible in Bach. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering to which extent when you play the left hand alone, you can still feel the music of the piece, or does it feel like really you're missing more than when you play the right hand alone? I feel like I understand the music better when it's my left hand alone. But the problem is twofold. It's, first of all, memory memorizing yeah. Bach is a new thing for me and I don't know why but in my mind it's all right hand all of the time when I'm actually playing it um, unless I pay really really special effort to my left hand and the other problem is um, the right hand by itself. Has it been the case when you learn sorry yeah go ahead well I was I said the problem was twofold first is memory the second is no I understood sound. that I was gonna say, yeah the sound is just the right hand is louder and it, it's just how I hear it. It comes out louder. When I, so when, when I you think the music, when, when you practice non-Bach, yes. other pieces, yeah. after Bach, inevitably you follow the top, no? Uh, you have to. I have and to. And therefore you verticalize the alignment of the two hands. Often. And that's probably where you memorize clearly because you memorize strategically the patterns. Even if the melodies, but you still, you know, visualize that or... <laughs> Exactly. I understand. And that's why the root is a bass melodic line is a little bit of a, awkward thing for us past the 19th century, uh, the 18, well, early 19th century. 
because it all becomes harmonized, harmonized melodic lines. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and it's sort of created the habit for me, even when I play this music, it's still- Because you force yourself to play it horizontally layered, which gives you trouble memorizing it. And in order to memorize, you have to remember how it fits on the beats. <laughs> I think you're you right and I like that. yeah I think you're right and I think I've just adapted the same strategy but with baroque you know flair and it's it comes out my right hand dominates the whole thing I think the uh, reason for this is because that shift happened with uh, the early Viennese school until Bach and a little bit after it was all about figured bass yes the melody, in fact, in the right hand or the top part, whichever, whoever played it, was the emanation of the harmonization. Mm -hmm. It's like the humidity creates the clouds <laughs> by evaporation of water mm -hmm. and not the clouds themselves appearing because when they rain back down, it starts again up. And it feels to me like all the music we play on the piano usually in terms of its uh, melodic and thematic material it's a melodic line that is harmonized mm -hmm. so when you have a melodic line harmonized or you have a melodic bass that is melodized <laughs> it's exactly the two opposites and I think that if you play the left hand alone and you speak the right hand, it might help a lot, no? Okay. Yeah, I'll practice that. Even if you don't solfege, just la la la. La 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 la. I mean, ideally it could be nice to do solfeging, but that is for the nerds <laughs> like me. And ultimately, it doesn't solve anything because it's not the point. The point is to be able to um, synthesize one of the voices by another than the fingers. Yes. So that's not only connected to the muscular memory of the piano playing. So once you can speak one and play another one, you already differentiate them better because you don't have to play them both. Of course, if you write them silently, just on paper, you hear them, but you write one at a time because you cannot write at the same time all. Mm -hmm. So inevitably you follow several and you build them like shelvings. And I, I think that there is a great merit in copying music. Yes, I think so too. For, for, the, uh, for the memorization of these bridges, these connectors, these, uh, the little things that are not thematic. Of course, everybody can remember. Oh God, me too. <laughs> that is an expressive moment that brings out. But the difficulty is all these other things, the, the little um, miscellaneous connections, which we have most trouble memorizing because they're sort of like neutral. They're not so expressively interesting. And so it's easy to memorize them vertically because therefore that's how we organize our two hands since we start playing piano and we have one keyboard. If we get two yeah. keyboard pianos it would help a lot because yeah. we start thinking independently. Oh, that would be amazing. Even people- Very heavy. Like, Can you imagine? <laughs> that would be so heavy. <laughs> but at least um, the reason of this layering would appear so more natural. Yeah, and that, but exactly. Or organists do that. Oh yeah. But the repertoire is not the same. They cannot play a Chopin waltz on the organ when they can. <laughs> Thank it God. Should be, <laughs> it shouldn't be really the case. Speaking of the Sarabande, I noticed that you took a tempo that was really at the borderline of falling asleep. Okay. Okay. Do you find that it's never calm enough? I, str I well, I want it to be calm. I, I'm I'm a tr I'm kind of mainstream in that way. I like the Sarabon <laughs> to be soft. I like it to be calm. But you know, I also like the way Gould plays it, and I let that. I sort of copy him sometimes when I play it. 
Can you play for me first? Oh, that's him, right? Yeah. Well, even weirder, he does um, coulées. Matthew, could you do the coulée? but without the second of the three notes, the passing tone, not being equally important, softer. Like, and not. Oh, okay. Because on the modern piano, when you play the second passing tone of the three notes of the coulée, then you inevitably create a dissonance. And the coulé is supposed to be the passing tone that joins the third of the chord. I don't know how he plays his coulé, but I would like you to play a lighter coulé. A coulé léger. <laughs> uh. Yes. And what about the phrasing in the right hand? When you recorded it on YouTube oh, for me, God. you played very legato the right hand, connected, longer phrases. Now, it was it because now you imitated Gould, but what about playing it Lawrence? Yeah, I, I... Have you ever... Oh, that was the one ornament that you played on the, on the upper note, Matthew. Because yeah, you already, well, you have the B, so you cannot replay, you shouldn't replay the B. Well, I, I was taught, at least by one person, you know, who I trust, by the way, uh, he said, always top note, even if it's... Even if you come from the upper note. In fact, the only time you don't is if there's a tie. But then it's a suspension. Because yes, but it's a suspended trill. But normally in a projector is a suspension that's replayed. And if you add, it's a lot of added Bs. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I do see where you're coming from and uh, we'll have to consult the rule book. Mm. I would say that when Beethoven starts 109, he also does the same problem with the repeated notes. But if you take out the stems, you hear. But he still plays the anticipation of the next melodic beat in the, in the decorative pattern of the first beat. You could have done. <laughs> But no, it has to be the repeated note. And so when I heard you play, uh, I was like, wow, that's heavy. I will that's, do. Yeah. But to tell you the truth, nobody the hell knows. Yeah, and if I was listening and I heard somebody play it from the A sharp, not having, if, I, if we had never had this conversation, I would call them lazy. And I'll call, and I would have called you if I didn't know you, overzealous. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the point of the arpeggiatura is to be a decoration already. And if it's in this case, it is a suspension. We already have a delay of the leading tone. If not, we would have had. So already by writing it with, this, with a tie, by delaying the resolution, we make it, um, we, uh, what is the word? Uh, we long for it, right? The longing. And then the resolution on top of it itches. You know, and, bites, and not only that, modern. but I was actually very frustrated with the recording. You know, if I could have, I don't know how many times you've recorded something and you just wish that you would have just done it again anyways after instead of sending it but um in the recording not only did i do the repeated note but it like it was incorrect i did it wrong or i caught the pedal and 
instead of hearing the A sharp, it ended up on the B natural at the end. It was like... Uh, and because of the way the pedal caught it. And it was like I didn't even play the A sharp. You know, this is our life as pianists. There is a um, fracture between our intent and what comes out. <laughs> yeah. I and sometimes um, we, have to, we have to accept how to deal with the unexpected that happens on stage or in performance or in recording. Because all of a sudden you practice to control it one way and it just owns you. And it tells you the hell with what you planned. I want it this way. <laughs> And I must say that in a philosophical point of view, this is much more important to nourish that kind of um, um, adapting to the unexpected while having some kind of set rules, ideology that can evolve in time. But it's a dialogue between what you want to do and what comes out. It is nothing worse than saying, when a teacher says, do more, and you say, but I was doing it. <laughs> so this will sound like a stupid question, but it's not. So why do we practice? What for? To, in order to, to uh, I know exactly why it's not dumb at all. It's the, it's the most philosophical question. We practice not to play like we practiced, but we practice in order to play with the unexpected at the performers, at the performance. So imagine you prepare to marry this blonde and at the moment you say, yes, you see it's another person. <laughs> and people are saying, but it's the wedding. So act like it's a wedding. <laughs> and so you prepared all your life. <laughs> and then you prepare it so well, but it comes out scrambled eggs. <laughs> so what do you do the next one? You do. And then people think, oh my God, it's a different edition. What a great idea. He has a musical <laughs> idea. And you did it on the spot on the second. It happened because you have to save your, your face for some kind of coherence. If not, they'll know you just messed up. Yep, yep. And so I find that the practicing is a repetitive, um, cognitive, and especially muscular memory situation where we gather enough um, muscular memory to leave a lot of the brain cells free <laughs> to think musically what we do when we perform instead of having all of them occupied at the playing of it. In other words, it's like an orchestra without conductor. <laughs> but the conductor without orchestra, of course, is very meaningful, meaningless. I just find that then most students consider that the practicing is in order to solidify the unexpected, to in fact ban it from happening. By isolating the, the chances of the unexpected. And I think that they don't realize that it's to do more with concentration of the brain than with muscular memory. Okay, it can save you during few bars. Yes, it can. But at some point, you realize that you're behind your piece playing, your, your brain is lagging. And when you're slightly ahead, you're always cruising. It's like the conductor who always beats a beat ahead and the orchestra plays always on the beat that he beat already earlier. It's like, it's, it's, it's like a magnetic pulling towards him which creates em emotion. And if a conductor stops playing, everybody slows down. And I'm, I'm thinking about... Iner like an inertia. Go ahead. I'm th I, well, I'm thinking about the, the pacing of, of, you know, your mind when you're playing. And it seems to me, I mean, you just touched on... Uh, what did you just touch on? Dealing with the unexpected, you mean? Yeah, and, and not only that, but cruising and, and, and keeping up with the music. Oh, yeah, keeping your brain cells free. That's, the, that's yeah. what I was thinking about. Yeah. And focusing and concentrating. And I understand that much about it. But I'm missing the opposite end of that, the part of the music where you can just kind of relax and not... So I think, think. that 
I think that depending on the, the, the technique expected for the given piece, obviously it's different if you play the Sarabande than if you play an etude by Chopin. But in terms of technique, I mean, and I think the difference is that the mental pressure, tension that you have to organize all these fingers in their independence, in their voicing, in their rhythm, in their articulation, blah, blah, blah. The making of it takes so much of your brain pressure that in fact you have a false sense of concentration. In fact, you're not concentrated at all. You're just absolutely frightened. It's like you're driving a deer is crossing. Yes. And the only thing you do is put the gas pedal and hope it's gonna stop, but you're panicked. And that's the thing very often when we play a piece that has many things going on at the same time, we are at the same time, at some point in the performance in some kind of a panic mode and we try to make sense of it. And so we relate a lot on the autoplay or the sort of um, uh, autopilot that fingers move and we just watch them move, but we are no more there intellectually because it overwhelms us. And so what I meant about thinking ahead, it was more about uh, the musical thought ahead of the section. So that you're always, um, it's like when you drive at night and you put the low beams, you see so little in front of you that you're very focused because you have to be reactive more to turn right away than if you are daylight where you see no matter how far. And then you don't have to be have that, you don't have that same pressure and tension that you have to be constantly reacting to save yourself on the spot. Whether you're there, you feel like you have more time to do it. And, and I so find that when you have Vista, when you perform, you feel like that. So what I notice is that when I listen to takes of my recording sessions, it's really strange because I hear somebody else while it's me, obviously. And I start to repertoriate on the paper the numbers of takes. And I say, take 47, and I start writing like to a student. Terrible, why with the noodle, <laughs> monstrous accent, stupid wrong note, blah, blah, blah. And then that is the fact. And then I hear other takes of the same section, and I try to compare them. And I realize this kind of concentric um, concentration that brings you to um, adjust your touch in order to reach what the first takes tried but missed because they were unfocused. Either the touch was too heavy, either the phrasing wasn't right. And most of the reasons that happens that with the recording sessions in my experience is that you arrive at the recording studio pumped up with the musical ideas that you want to record. Yes. And as soon as you start playing, the weight comes out on that instrument that day in that room with this recording uh, equipment and you hear it to monitor, you go like, that's not at all what I wanted to do. I intended this, I intended that. And then you realize, okay, I have to adjust. So instead of this, that I thought I'll do, I'll do in fact this way. Instead of the touch, I'll play legato. Instead of slow, I play fast. And all of a sudden you try to find the coherence that corresponds to the um, elements in which you bathe at that point. The type of uh, of our action of the piano, heavy or light, or with an uneven keyboard here and there. The acoustics, the way you hear it in the tone engineering, some microphone placed one way or the other brings you different aspects of the texture. And your idealized musical so, um, sound picture that you're painting in your mind before you go to the, to the recording doesn't translate. You feel like I cannot do what I wanted to do, but something else comes out that I didn't intend to do. But unlike the concert, you have the time with the takes to sort of zoom into it until you find the right tools for the right musicianship expression. The problem with the performance once through in front of people is that you have to adapt with all this in real time. Yeah. It's like, my God, I spent 20 years planning this and now it's going exactly the opposite and I have to make sense of it on the spot if people will know that I messed up. And so this is, I think, where the speed of the brain thinking and being slightly ahead helps to manage that instead of only being survival mode where you go, oh my God, I made it. Okay, what about if I miss? Oh no, and the next. And then it's only on the spot. And if you're ahead of time, you start thinking um, a little less panicked and you still see a little bit further. And I find of course in a slower tempo is different because the difficulty when you play a slow tempo like what you took in the Sarabande is not how slow it is. 
is how slower it gets. It's very difficult to maintain a slow tempo without a slow down. Yeah. Which is why most wise teachers say, don't start the slow movement too slow. Because inevitably you'll slow down. That's the word of wisdom of experience. Yeah. <laughs> it's not to do with a lot with music uh, by itself, but it's to do with the expression. That's what you do in chamber music constantly. Yeah. And so in fact, um, um, when you play, uh, every piano starts the slow movement of the Ravel Concerto. Oh God, it's so beautiful. I have the time and the harmony and the melody and the decoration slow mordant and so you have the time to enjoy while you play it's almost narcissistic but when you play something very fast it's no time to enjoy anything you're just focused and not missing because I practiced it I don't want to mess it up miss 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 and what is funny with that section of the carnival, of the um, fantasy, is that for some fallacious reasons that to do with the dictatorship of the wrong note, everybody determines the quality of the performance of the piece by how many or no wrong notes you've played in the quarter of the second movement, which is so childish. But we all surrender to that. And the same thing with the Mephisto vals. So it all becomes about agility, circus style. And when you play something, <laughs> see, it's hard. Imagine if in the performance, Matthew, you give them an option of six or seven types of ornaments in a row. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today in Phenomenology 1.1, I'll play for you with a choice of ornaments. You make what you like, I give you all. So, Mr. Naumov, I have a question in this vein. How, how can, I'm, and I'll pretend like we're audience members watching yeah. somebody else play. How can we listen in a way that avoids thinking about their mistakes? is because when they play, they signal psychologically to us that they are fearing. It's, yes, but even if they don't, sometimes we always catch ourselves, ah, they made a mistake there. Ah, I know that note's wrong. That note's wrong. That's wrong. That's oh, you wrong. mean the wrong note. I thought you meant when you sense that the musician is no, 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 uh, no, no, no. nervous. Well, e even that too. So, well, when, they, when they're only signaling to us that they made a mistake, then, you know, that's just what we hear. And I'm guilty of that too. Even in the recording that I sent you at the end, it's like, oh my God, I'm Paul nervous. Badura, Paul Badura Skoda yeah. used to have a very interesting tick uh, when he made the wrong note. He was to, he, used, he usually put off his tongue out in the air. <laughs> you know, well, the famous good. picture of, um, what's his name? Of um, the famous photography of um, Einstein. Yeah. Where he has the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what um, Skoda <laughs> used to do. So you knew he made a wrong note, but it looked clown fun. So, but I mean, just when we're listening, how can we stop thinking about the person who's playing? And what, how should we, how can we listen better? So you speak about the listener not being disturbed by the wrong note? Or the listener trying to listen beyond the wrong note? Both. I remember in the Tchaikovsky competition, when people were playing the Chopin etude in the first round and made the slightest wrong note in this flow of notes, the audience was going, woo. That's disgusting. Collectively. That's disgusting. It's like attending some ice hockey game, you know. <laughs> So it felt like a competition in its purest trivial form, which is like, you know, gladiators. <laughs> I fight, I die. <laughs> and um, I think 
On one side, it shows that they know the notes and they're not an audience of juries. Of course, they're regular audience. The jury doesn't boo, at least that I know. But the audience did because they are there in the hall at the same time. And so you could say, oh, wow, they're so knowledgeable. I still think that um, the concept of the wrong note is a very um, difficult thing to define because you have the wrong note that sounds plausible <laughs> because they're with the same harmony or they're in the same melodic line. In other words, they are wrong because they're not right, but they don't sound ugly wrong or, or they don't sound wrong. They sound, I don't know if I do. it's wrong but it doesn't sound like Bach couldn't have done it too yeah then compared to if you do that's the clownesque yeah. obvious yeah. and I think that very often um, our perception is that when we make the mistake in fact and it's always in the spot we never expected that we always covered and that God gets us so angry that it happened, that instead of focusing ahead to save what's left ahead, we are going inside ourselves in the rear view mirror. Why the hell did I do that while driving? <laughs> in fact, we are more puzzled and angered at ourselves. Gosh, why did I spend all these times in the practice room if I'm going to mess it up as if I didn't practice it? In other words, we are angry that our muscular memory didn't, uh, failed us, sorry. And so we spend too much time during the performance um, in real time, was it perhaps it's disgust or perhaps it's um, unease or it's just disappointment. And it's difficult to get over the disappointment. And in fact, in performance, you have to accept this disappointment as if you ignore it and you just go constantly forward. And then once it's finished, you can always dwell. But the problem is that that doesn't happen easily. We are often very upset because usually this kind of mistake is to do with a connection between the brain and the finger or a disconnect. And so sometimes strangely, we land by luck on the right note when we were very uneasy. And sometimes we know exactly what to do and as is against your own will, you go in the wrong note. And so the problem with this is that today, I would say the recordings are way too much uh, edited. And so they made the audience expect everybody to play nominally right all the time. And so anybody who doesn't fit the MP3 that I have in my ears is an amateur. Yes, I agree. I think that they, they lost the perception of the importance of the live performance. Like when you go to a theater play mm -hmm. and you hear distinctly a, a, an actor stutter or search for his word, for his line, which of course you don't never see in film because they retake it. Yes. And so we are, we lose a lot of that acceptance. And I would say that if the artists who perform on stage are so involved musically, thankfully the mistakes, whatever type of mistakes they are, are not so prevalent for the audience of the moment because there is something spiritually connecting with the music itself the, the two parts, the performer and the listener, the more passive and more active in, in some kind of togetherness. And if the music is so beautifully moving itself and it's lived live at the moment, it becomes like a moment you shared and you go like, oh God, I'll remember forever that moment because it's not only the music, it's not only the performance, is the atmosphere, the moment, it's, we all gathered for this to happen. And then you remember it sometimes very long time after, like some fragrance and you go, wow, that was unforgettable. And if ever you listen to a recording of that mythical moment that you heard, 
you, and you hear it at distance with a certain objective mind, you realize that it's full of defects. But in your mind as a listener, you, you, one tends to, I think, idealize it. Yes. That's so and true. so in a way, it's, it's good that it's idealized because it means that as humans, we tend to go for something that elevates us and brings us together. And of course, you can play among other people say, oh, God, too bad. They don't go like, oh, my God. Um, but I still think that the fear of the pianists of the wrong note is because it's always about going through the routine cleanly. And so then the whole point is to go through the routine cleanly. And if you didn't pass all the obstacles exactly how you planned, you, put, you set yourself for disappointment. If you say, I'm going to be messy and you make two mistakes, you go, wow, that was good. But because you aim in practicing at being reliably perfect in terms of the notes, and nevertheless, one of them doesn't come out right, or you play the cracks, or you play the other note, or something. It angers you more than it upsets you. It angers you because you feel like all these hours were evaporated, you know, for nothing. I could have gone with my friends instead of staying at home and practicing in order for me to be reliable today. And so that's why I think most of the um, difficulty for the pianist is that they have to manage so many elements of music, often polyphony, but not yes. always, or sometimes chordal complexities. Harmony, rhythm. And of course, you could say that a violinist or a singer are more exposed with a single voice, because if it's not perfectly pitched, perfectly vibrato, perfectly pl placed, there's nothing. Yeah. No pedal, no harmony to cover it up. But at the same time, their focus is on one note at a time, every time. So they know they're watched like they're heard holistically for one note at a time. <laughs> Whenever the pianists, if they play, and there is one wrong note in the middle of all this, it's idiotic to say, but it matters less. Yeah. Like if you play the beginning of the Rachmanin of Sonata and you put the wrong note, nobody knows it. Because you've played most of the keys. Yes, yeah, exactly. In the same, in the same pedal. And if you go, um, I will take an example of your minuet today. Can you play that like you did at the recording? Play like you did at the recording. What a great statement. In fact, what you, what you did is you played like in a Schubert um, piano piece, imaginary um, voicing of stems. Yeah, I do, I guess. I just I like it too much. Well, I understand. But that's, that's, uh, that's, that's exactly where the stylistic approach has to determine some of the parameters. In other words, what is the purpose of the F sharp? Is in fact an ostinato that stays there. And then the melody. And so because he repeats the F sharp constantly, we, we know that it repeats, but in fact in pure melodic value, that F sharp is unimportant. It should have been held. Yeah, exactly. And because he repeats it in order to not forget it, because if not, you don't hear it anymore. <laughs> then you start thinking every arpeggio, sorry, excuse me, every interval between the top F sharp is expressive because you have stretched intervals 
from a dropping F sharp. A third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. And that makes you play very expressively the stretched intervals. On top of it is the leading tone, which is very expressive. And I think if you forget about the F sharp in the terms of the same intensity as the notes on the beats, can you play? At least you don't play. And so the hierarchy of notes have different meaning. Those are passing, those are thematic, those are tonal, those are leading tone, therefore they are also determining the tone. And then you have those that determine the dominant, dominant ostinato. With an exchange of voices of the others. And so uh, you could also think Bach could have written like it does in book one. So you could say that um, what makes you play it so legato is because you find it more expressive. And if I ask you to play, you'll say, I cannot stand that. It's well, so mundane. No, I mean, that's actually the why, reason I love that piece. You know, the menuet, the first menuet, that's why I decided to play this French suite. I but you like it. it singing. No, I love, it's, it's the acoustic. I think I'm, uh, I'm compensating for the acoustic. If it was a hall, I would play those as short. So it's too I dry and therefore can. the acoustic would have uh, put the sound halo. It, it sounds like I'm pecking. At, at a empty jar or something. And what about the B section? What do you do with it? More legato or more detached? Hmm. Well, since I, since I play the first one legato, I play it more detached. Then he, he have an augmented second melodically in this one. Earlier, can you replay the trio again? Uh, no, continue. Oh, there it is, yeah. You know, it's 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 one note is over here and one note's over here. That's why uh, I that's didn't, because didn't see of it. that. When he changed the line, he forgot <laughs> which was his six degree flat or sharp. You know, it's interesting that the chromaticism probably defines the best Bach in general for his musical language. Because most of the composers um, used chromatics, um, a little bit, chromaticism, sorry, a little more um, restrainedly than Bach. Bach seems to powder everything in chromaticism. It's like some kind of um, addiction. He loves it. In, and I think it's to do with the tuning, of course, but it's also to do with the fact that he finds in the chromaticism some kind of um, um, expression of um, intensity and perhaps of some kind of anxi uh, anxiousness. I find that, for instance, even when he writes very um, stately pieces or very church music, like if, of the Bach chorale in E flat, he would do... Uh, Um, melodic um, dissonances to the chromaticism, I think he was, um, he abused them. <laughs> and what always I find very striking, when you study harmony, they tell you that you have the modes major, minor, 
and for the chromatic is every step the same step. So by essence, it should be neutral. It shouldn't be major or minor since it only has semitones. But in the music literature, all the chromatic pieces are 99% in, in minor. So I think they associate the uh, sorrowful expression of the minor seconds in the chromaticism, since it's on every, on every note, with minor. It's very rare to hear a chromatic piece in major. Yeah. And I think for Bach, when he does the, uh, or in B minor, he chooses where. It's very la note choisie, the chosen moment for the expression. And it's, it doesn't strike right away. It just, it's part of the flow. And um, it's sort of a colorization of, of an effect. What do you know about jigs as a tradition in general? Almost nothing. In terms of the music, not the dance. <laughs> Almost nothing. I mean, Irish. Yeah, I understand, but. No, they um, say I. They say Irish, right? Yeah. No, no, yeah. I know, but that that Bach certainly. I don't think Bach ever danced ever. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. But my point is, is that um, there is that sense of leap, which um, is very important to the jig because the jig is um, literally um, a shiver, a, 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 a fast movement. Usually it was danced by the men to impress the lady that they can jump high so they have <laughs> strong thighs. And that's what it is, gigoter, uh, the verb in French is to be jittery. So um, the idea of, and he adds to you this specific pattern in the beginning that Bach uses all the time is the shorter values decorative are first. Whenever in the beginning of the second half of the uh, eight, uh, 18th century, after he died, people would have do, the short ones in the weak beat before the downbeat. And Bach uses it often on the downbeat, which makes him stop before the end. Mm -hmm. So you have a note. Which to do with that element of flow of, of energy given on the downbeat, the short long. how it goes. What is the uh, indication you have in 3-8? Does it give you any phrasing? No, just bars, 3-8. So what do you do in the right hand when you play like you play? C, uh, C well, do I, I, you I like, or do you connect? I like to play it short, but I've been warned not to play it too short. And um, wait, because it, it becomes confusing with the other part, the, the other voice. You know? Well, just because it's an ugly sound. Ugly? I think I think that that leap, that air, that staccato between the eighth note and the downbeat, ta ti ta ta da ti ti ti, is very characteristic of the, of, of, of a jig. Not ugly at all. Of course, he stylized a lot of the dances he wrote on the keyboard from the original choreography. For instance, he has like in the G major, the French suite, number one. And you hear mostly the downbeats. And here you have three, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, and not one, two, three, one, two. And then um, in the E minor uh, sixth partita, the jig, which shouldn't be called jig, has this undetermined meter. You know, you must have seen it. It's like a balloon slashed by a slice. Or like it looks like two oh, a really? 
It looks like two alabreves facing each other. Wow. No, I haven't seen it. That's amazing. And, and it's a very difficult, um, mysterious style uh, of notation of a meter that nobody really knows what it means. I mean, loosely it makes sense. It makes like as if you have a 4-2 in fact. Since you have twice two two. But when you hear it, it sounds like a chromatic fugue, which is what it is. In the texture, in the in the genre. But he calls then jig many different type of things he wants to call jig. Yeah, true. I personally don't have expertise on the choreography of an anglais. Have you researched uh, Bach on dance or dance on Bach? A, a little bit. I worked with it on, I worked on this piece with my harpsichord teacher and uh, he seemed to know a lot about Baroque dance. And so what did he say about the Anglaise? What is, was, what is specific to the Anglaise? I, I can't remember. Um, I remember it. He said it was heavy. They were, he were, they were making uh -huh. fun of the English for being heavy. That's what the... French thought of the Germans. <laughs> right, so the German reading in French thought the English Everybody were heavy. The other is heavy. Yeah. At least they all agreed the Italians are frivolous. Yes, true. But the fact is, is that uh, the French thought that they own the good taste. <laughs> and therefore, all the other dances were contrasting with the French elegance, which would be the minuet. It's like the Germans are too much, the Italians are too this, the Irish are too that, but the French is the minuet. Yes. And menu in French means small, mm -hmm. which meant small steps. Yes. And the um, big um, castle, um, French um, medieval to Renaissance castles, um, ballrooms were called, uh, were also used for playing ancient tennis called jeu de pomme, it was like a, tennis game. So they, these big spaces were used for ballroom dancing or for sports. And they were called in French, um, Hotel des Menus Plaisirs du Roi, which meant the place for the small pleasures of the king. Yes. The big pleasures being honoring his mistresses. And that was because politically it was important because we have the Spanish queen and the, uh, you know, but for the small pleasures, which was just to dance among us and play with each other tennis, menu, plaisir du roi, les petits menu means small. Mm -hmm. And menuet means literally a smaller. Mm -hmm. And so compared to those more demonstrative dances, the menuet was a little bit more withheld. So they thought it had, a little, I mean, the, the gestures of the Baroque dancing. So it was considered sort of the good taste versus those exaggerations of the others. Though I must say that courant must have been fun because they don't only go in rounds, but they go like in, in, in line, yeah, following each other's arms. Hmm? And jumping and everything, yeah. They jump, but mostly run. Yeah. Run holding hands. So, and they make serpents or kind of different shapes or rounds. And it's interesting because rondo normally is the Italian word that is used by Haydn for the finale of the ABACADA form of the movements. Whenever Bach wrote in the um, first partita, rondo in spelling in French, E A U X, not O, the Italian one. And from all pieces, the last movement of the second partita is not a jig, not even a dance. He calls it, diver not divertissement, he calls it capriccio. <laughs> Mostly because of the dip of the tets. So I feel like for sure he was not constrained to a specific, let's say, stylistic na na narrative. I think he felt like he's writing something Italian, something French, something English, but in fact, it's always him. Yes. I don't think that he was, he was very ethnomusicologically uh, interested. 
um, <laughs> to explore those different things. And that's why I mentioned Froberger because he's one of the rare people of the time who traveled so much and captured so much of the different influences that in fact, he influenced a lot of the lands where he returned to in Germany once he had been filtering through his own psyche, obviously, the Italianate and the French styles, other than only a distant imitation. He, he embodied it. And Caspar yeah. Fischer is also a very interesting German composer for that. And um, there are some lesser known before Bach who traveled. I mean, obviously Handel traveled. Yes. But the problem with that is that I think that Bach um, was profoundly Lutheran. I think for him the dances was okay, but he wrote it just to make sure he writes suites like the French clavecinist and his students to study with. But I still think that for him, for him writing a six voice fugue was way more meaningful yeah. in life. Yes. And writing cantatas weekly was way more meaningful for his faith. Yes. But I'm sure that um, when he was teaching or, see, or his children were teaching, they used all these for, um, for practicing. And of course, it's very different when you study then, having learned how to dance the dances and you play them on the keyboard, you naturally translate them in a way. But to us, I mean, I've never danced any of these dances in person. So for me, they're, I know they're dances, but in fact, <laughs> Yeah, I play them like a piece of music. I don't play yeah. them as a piece of dance. Me too. What dance would you have, would you have had dance that you can play? A waltz, perhaps? I mean, I've I've never really done any ballroom dancing. They don't teach they don't teach it anymore. So kids in middle school, you know, nowadays we mostly just sit around and mope. Shake. <laughs> yeah, that too. Sometimes. No, because I was thinking, if anything, in some. Um, traditions people dance walls yeah not mine they do i think but uh I've never because done. then you play the vals noble by ravel you play la vals by ravel you play any evocation of a vals by another composer it's also compared to what the dancing of it brings as a pleasure but i still think that um that is the whole purpose of the harpsichord music is it doesn't have yet its proper identity as a solo instrument for its repertoire. So it's imitative of the dance and the singing. And then with the fugues, the sonata form, yeah. it, the pure music becomes its own element. Even if there is dancey feeling in many pieces like Beethoven sonata, some of them, I mean... <laughs> certainly very um, evocative of some kind of a flow but you know no it's true we don't dance anymore at least those dances not here not where I'm from anyways and where are you from North Dakota there is no North Dakota dance well there is actually uh... You know, I have a bit of an ethnomusicological project on it, actually. I discovered that there was a festival of North Dakotan ethnic music in 19... Marvelous! In 1983. Wow! Yeah, Somebody I... really worked on their homework, 83. Yes. And, and uh, so what can you do with that? Well, her, I, I met the director of the festival. She's 98 now. And uh, when I helped her move out of her townhouse, we found the old VHS tapes. And um, we, we, we put them, I put them on YouTube. I made them digital. It was a huge project. Um, That's great. Actually, actually, I'm going to send you the link if, if, if you- I'm very me. excited. And so is it like a, what kind of dance? Is it square dance or some kind of a- It's, it's even weirder. It's more like circle dances. And, circle dances. Yeah. And- um, is it separate genders? Because um, oftentimes, yes. Um, but, you know, North Dakota is a huge hodgepodge of ethnic groups. In that festival, I can imagine. In that festival, there was like, I think, 20 different ethnic groups. They had 
Germans from Russia, they had Norwegians, Swedes, Finns, Celts, Danes, you know, Poles. Uh, did I say Finns? Um, uh, and then they have uh, Native Americans, you know, Indians. Um, and then there was, you know, instrumental music. There was fiddling. There was uh, choirs, everything. I mean, you, you would really, really love to see this. It's really think. marvelous that there is such a melting pot of... Um, of uh, backgrounds of people who, mm -hmm. who found their future life in another land, basically. Yeah, and in the festival- Made it was, their own. Yeah, yeah, and there was actually new groups created here too. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Hutterites, but- No, um, but I will now that you say. Yes, they're a, they're a, a hidden gem. They're a sort of, do you know the Amish people? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so it's sort of like that. We have colonies of Hutterites that live in North oh, Dakota. Oh, I see. And I didn't this, know. on um, part part three of the video series, um, there is a rare example of Hutterite choir singing. They sing in um, they sing in polyphony, but in a way that you've never never heard, heard before. before. Never. And where does those traditions trace to? Is it Northern Europe or Holland or? Well, I, I think, I, I, I don't know the history of the Hutterites. I believe... I mean, they might have their own uh, genetic tree, so to say. They, well, that's the thing. They might have been a sort of North Dakota specialty. You know, they might have <laughs> been a, an Amish offshoot. I think they speak a, mostly German. I think they speak... I see. I, they speak, the, they're kind of their own form of German. I see. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll send you the, f the festival. And, I'll and so send this you lady, I, I look forward to it. This lady was 98. Yes. Tamara she initiated this project? Yes. She was our first um, music history teacher. Well, not the first music history teacher, but the first female music history teacher we had. And I believe that she was the first ethnomusicologist in North Dakota. She never called herself an ethnomusicologist. But yeah, perhaps that's not, it was, it's difficult to know when you're what. Yeah. It, it, you're mostly <laughs> defined by the others for what you are or what you're not. Yeah. But you hardly define yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I still think that this is very important tradition because most of the people today with the globalization tend to erase all the originalities, would it be accents, regional culture, regardless what type. It's just that it's considered sort of not cool. <laughs> no, it definitely. And, and yeah, what practice. is cool is to be globalized and, you know, everywhere is the same just because we have the same. But in fact, the original uh, ways of thinking that come from original ways of um, living basically it's all about rituals in life. Yes. How you consider the death, how you consider the marriage or the, uh, the, the procreation, the joy, I mean, the cycles of life. And, so, and, and it's nice that all of these different ethnicities or backgrounds of um, live in harmony with each other. Yeah. There is no confrontation, I assume. Is it because it's so much space? Yeah, there's very little confrontation here. A lot of space. It's very hard. It was very hard to live here. It was just farming all the time and dirt and stuff. And um, so inevitably, you know, that it must have made them strong to survive. Well, not only that, but they had to cooperate. So they had, yeah. Well, sometimes you do it out of necessity. Indeed. But when you see the history of some of the uh, ethnic situations in some countries or uh, geographic areas, you realize that. Uh, they always find good reasons to confront. It is unfortunate. And so are you going to um, develop this project by bringing it to a new dimension well, I, after her 83 attempt? I, I want, well, I think it'll be the last time there will ever be a festival of ethnic music in North Dakota. I really think it's the last time. Most of the people in the video are dead. And... Um, they didn't pass their tradition down very much. Um, and what is the reason you think for that? Is that the, exactly the globalization of the next generations overtook it? Well, and 
we have a lot. We have a problem where a lot of the people are moving away from the small towns. That's yeah, the so the big thing. towns are becoming little globalization hubs. And that's where all the culture is. There's, you know, there is culture in the small towns, but musical culture, and recordings. You know, recordings have destroyed. You know, it's something that music. reminds me of what you obviously know by by ethnomusicology. That's what Bartok did in the Balkans. Of course. Way back in the twenties. And it's, in a way, pioneering and at the same time, sadly, sons, the, the sunset of it too. Yes. Because had he not they, they done that, today we would have lost these uh, oral traditions of songs, dances, whatever they are. Of course, codifying them in the notation of Western culture was, for Bartok, I think, the way to make it more universal and i'm not sure how much the notation um translated exactly what they were singing or playing <laughs> because it could be that those uneven rhythms are not always seven eight or five eight they could be five and a half eight seven and a half in other words the people who are doing music by oral transmission from generation on they don't do it with the knowledge of the notation they do it just by the pulse the the, the melody you know yeah. The feel. Yeah. And my project was, I mean, Bartok's project was massive in scale. I mean, he, it was an amazing thing that he did. And my project pales in comparison. All I did was put them on YouTube. Um, I'm not an ethnomusicologist or anything like no, that. No, but, but you, you have a sensitivity towards the, um, for instance, you mentioned all this because of a specific dance from North Dakota. Yeah, exactly. And <clears throat> I did. I did try to get the Library of Congress to take it. They wouldn't. They wouldn't even put it in their records um, because, because they, they consider it uh, unimportant. Well, this is a good thing. I think it. It. They have too much stuff already to put in there, and so I'm like, well, hopefully, you know, there's tons and tons of ethnic music festivals happening around the United States where they don't even want our <laughs> North Dakota. I doubt it. The only recorded North Dakota ethnic music festival. I mean, we're just North Dakota. No one really cares, but uh, I, was, well, I thought but it was a shame. I find that to be a very uh, beautiful extension of the um, conversation about um, the um, purpose of a Bach Baroque suite of dances. Yes. out of its time period and out of its instrument time period and we're so remote compared to all what it meant to them then yeah and so we have to reimagine it so what you're saying is that even between 83 1983 and now there is a loss so imagine between 1722 and today well you asked you asked at the meeting the other day if i ever talked to the composers yeah and i mean I, I feel such a gap. I can't even really imagine it now. But it's it's the really amazing thing is that we still like the music. Like it still speaks to me, even though it, it is so old. It's a, it's a strange combination of um, archaic um, attitudes and then some kind of um, eternal present. For instance, present time, I mean, because I find it very striking. When you go to a museum, you look at artifacts, it's all based on chronology. You know, <laughs> this bone of this uh, um, uh, dinosaur corresponded to this time period in that area of the world. So it's all about placing it in context. And so in a way, we should think that the music we play of the past is like visiting a museum artifact that is interesting for what it is, which is a museum artifact, not for becoming part of my daily life routine. And for some reason, classical, as they call it, music, tend to be written way before us in mm -hmm. time periods that we are totally ignorant or unable to imagine. And so we just extract the music and we put it in our life and somehow the message of the music itself would it be i don't know the melodic thematic whatever you call it talks to us at the present 
It's like when you play a piece by Chopin, you don't think you're playing a 19th century composer. You know it, but when you play it, it's now. Yeah. It has the same relevance than it might have had then. And I find that um, most people don't understand when they're not um, interested in classical music because they think that everything classical is like some kind of bag in which you put all the old stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Everything, everything modern is extremely calibrated by styles. So you, when you go on the radio satellite station, they give you 100 type of stations for different subcategories of pop music. And then one station but, for classical. But for classical is one for all the centuries of music. So, you know, when you tell them there is a difference between Guillaume de Machaut and Debussy, <laughs> and they go, so what's the difference? But if you tell them Elvis and the Beatles sound the same, they're gonna look at you like, you're out of your mind. Yeah. Because yeah. these subtleties are relevant to them. And when we talk to them about what Frescobaldi means to us, they go like, oh my God, so I listen to that and I have a headache, you know? <laughs> and I find that this is a major problem is that our civilization is so based on the competitivity of today, especially with the screens that give us information without any background. And so we are stressed in the dailiness. And every time we try to imagine the past in its um, chronology, at some point for most people, it disappears. I think beyond their grandparents is somewhere with the ancient times. And so I always find people who are passionate for history can easily become passionate for ethnomusicology can be passionate for geography, can be passionate about etymology of the words, how they traveled with which tribe and which um, uh, movement of population. And, and then it becomes very more meaningful because you start seeing little dots that connect little dots. Yes. And it, and it makes you realize that there is some kind of a invisible thread there. But it's true that for most people, they don't want to do the effort. And for classical music, we are obliged to play music of the past every day, so we don't think of it even. It's only when we study it in theory or in music history class that we start organizing it. It was such a pleasure, Matthew. Yeah. This is Who are the most beautiful composers, figures, collection that you have? It's amazing. <laughs> we we found them at a garage sale. Uh, it's is Mendelssohn. it quintet? Yeah, quintet of musicians. Yeah, and is, is it Mendelssohn Bach? Kind of an uh, oddball. No, I don't have Bach, which is frustrating. No, that's what you I, I hate. I hate to say it, but I would trade Mendelssohn for Schubert if I could. I've never played any Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn, Liszt, Chopin, Brahms, and then Rachmaninoff at the end. I understand Brahms because he looks like a smurf <laughs> with a beard, but I don't picture what the statuette of Rachmaninoff of that size can show of this giant who was two meters tall. It's, it's, it's a really weird statue. It actually, it looks bad. I don't know how to explain it, but it was at a But you know it's Rachmaninoff. Oh, yes. Well, no, you really, you want to see him? I'll just show him. I'm not saying that you should, but it's just that it must be stylized like the dancers. It doesn't even really look like him. He looks almost like Horror, like Rubinstein or something. Like a young Rubinstein. It's very interesting. There is something to it though. Wow. Very interesting. Well, but listen, they, Lawrence, I look they, forward to hear, oh, oh my God. They I chose the old Bach. list. No, In the old list. the old list. You know, when he was 11 year old, he played the recital in Vienna. List. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Czerny dragged Beethoven to the concert hall. And Beethoven told him, I don't care about children prodigies. And Czerny dragged Beethoven and Beethoven went backstage or on stage, whatever, when Be List finished as a child and kissed his forehead. Yes. 
And so about 70 years later, or 75 years later, when Liszt was an old teacher, he was telling students of his, like Lichitsky and others, about that encounter with Beethoven. And that Beethoven told him when he hugged him or kissed him, told him, continue what you do. I never learned anything from Haydn. <laughs> and I thought that a weird thing because how would a 10 year old Hungarian boy understand an old deaf German man and Liszt was supposedly very keen at telling the story to his students to the point that no matter what you study, it's what you become that matters. And that Beethoven supposedly told him this to let him not, um, say to, let's say, not give up on his own creativity. Wonderful. But I like that story very much. Haydn never taught me anything. Or I didn't learn anything from Haydn, you know. Okay.